Hello, good evening everyone. I'm Michelle Batty and I'm the manager of the, uh, Euro the European Reference Network for Rare Eurogenital Diseases and Complex Conditions, which we call Eurogen. So briefly, uh, to introduce what Eurogen is, it's one of the 24 European reference networks created in 2017 by the European Commission. Um, and the 24 networks cover most medical fields. Um, we aim to deliver quicker specialist evaluation and more equitable access to high quality diagnosis, treatment and care for patients with a rare urogenital disease or complex condition that require highly specialised surgery. So our main activities are providing virtual consultations cross-border using a secure platform uh, for, so that clinicians can discuss these particularly rare or complex cases. Um, we also collaborate on education and training activities and we're actually building a, a, a Eurogen registry at the moment um, so that we hope that all our hospitals will be able to contribute their patients to the registry. Um, so that, that's enough about Eurogen. So this evening uh, we've got a very interesting webinar uh, on guidelines for neurogenic bladder and bowel in children and adolescents. And we're really happy this evening because we have Giovanni Mossiello, uh, who's been collaborating with Eurogen since the very beginning. He's our disease area coordinator on non-syndromic uropathies. And he's the senior consultant paediatric urologist in the Department of Surgery and Head of Urological Di Division for Reconstructive Surgery for Continence and Neurourology at Bambino Yezu Pediatric Hospital in Rome in Italy. Uh, so thank you so, so much uh, for sharing uh, your expertise with us this evening, Giovanni, and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to all for this kind of introduction and for this opportunity to be there and to offer my contribution and uh, on uh, guidelines uh, on neurogenic bladder. And uh, I hope that the presentation will be interesting and uh, we have a lot of things to discuss and uh, I will go to start. And. Uh, Okay, this is my potential conflict of interest, and uh, this is a summary of the presentation of today, epidemiology, etiology, pathophysiology, and diagnosis management, and some take-home message. Neurogenic bladder is a neurogenic distributive dysfunction, so it do a, a lesion at any level of nervous system. And, uh, we normally divide in suprapontin, subpontin, supraspinal, subsacral. The bladder ciliary and voiding action is very simple, everyone pee, but is a, a very a, difficult to maintain a normal pee. And uh, there is an action of filling, an action of voiding, and uh, there is uh, an opposite action of the tusor and bladder neck. The innervation is an innervation a different control, and uh, we have uh, some supraspinal control in the cortex, in the periaqueductal gray, hypothalamus, medulla, the pontine mentulation center, that uh, is a, a reflex center, and uh, the spinal pathways that involve the mentulation. We have the sympathetic parasympathetic and somatic pudendal nerve. The actions are different and sympathetic, we can define that the store urine, and on the opposite, parasympathetic, push urine. And the same innervation of the bladder is the same of the bowel, and this is an explanation why we have, when we have a neurogenic bladder, we, uh, it's common to observe that we have a neurogenic bowel. For the 
functional point of view, normally it's common to observe four different patterns. An overactive detrusor with the overactive sphincter, overactive detrusor with the underactive sphincter, underactive detrusor with the overactive sphincter, and underactive detrusor and sphincter. In some cases, in two particular patterns, we could observe a high to risk high pressure pattern for upper urinary tract with severe high detrusor pressure over 40 centimeters of water. And this pattern are where we observe a neurogenic detrusor overactivity with dysenergia and where we have a low compliance high pressure bladder with a sphincter activity and underactive detrusor and blood. In which situation we can observe this dysfunction? Uh, we can observe in open, in the open and closed spinal dystrophy, in the injury, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injury, tumor, metabolic disease, genetic disease, other neurological disease. Spinal dystrophy is the most common pattern observed for neurogenic bladder and bowel in pediatrics. And in the 12%, there are no signs of dysfunction at the birth. At the birth, normally, the majority of children have normal upper urinary tract. And the term minor dysplasia or spinal dysplasia includes a lot of different conditions and is difficult to define. And we are working with the working group of spina bifida with the ERN Eurogen, ERN, ERN Ithaca, in order to offer a most complete definition of spinal dystrophy, because if we consider some definition, we have a no rare condition. In other, considering the more severe defect, we have a severe condition. Spinal bifida is a, a standard rate for new birth every year and as you observe including the prophylaxis with folic acid, uh, folic acid and considering the interruption we have a high percentage of rate every year. Spinal bifida open is a real disease. Normal upper urinary tract we operate, we can operate in fetal or after the birth but we have to manage this patient, not only for the urological aspect, but we have to manage for orthopedic, neurogenic, fetal, metabolic, cardiac, and so on. Different for close defects. We have a worsening during age. We have a deterioration during age. And there are two critical points for occult spinal dysmorphism, two points for tethering. And one, the first one, and during the first three years of life, and then at the puberty. Pediatric spinal cord injury is rare, and but is a common observed in pediatric too, and in some cases is a missed diagnosis, and in some cases we miss because we don't have a radiological lesion, is as defined as Shaiwura. And other group of patients and the neurovesical dysfunction after treating pelvic neoplasm. For some of them, as for sacrococcygeal teratoma, it's very common to observe uh, neurogenic bladder and bowel, as well for pelvic neuroblastoma. In other, it's rare to observe. Anyway, today is a large group of survival where you can observe. Uh, neurogenic bladder and bowel dysfunction. Other group, interesting group, is the anorectal malformation group, where we can observe a spinal dystrophy with a normal sacrum too, and we can observe a dysfunction of the lower urinary tract in some particular situation when there is a rectal urethral fistula or in female with the cloaca. And another group of patients where we have to, we can observe a 
neurogenic bladder and bowel is the group of cerebral palsy and the group of AB, the group of acquired brain injury. As a large group, the single one is very small because all of them are rare disease, are many neuromuscular metabolic disease and genetic disease that we can observe in pediatric patients. Small group, rare disease, but the sum of all represent a large population, now all survival, where we have to treat neurogenic bladder and neurogenic bowel. And this is the first point to discuss uh, for my presentation because we have several guidelines, the European Association of Urology with the European Society of Pediatric Urology, the BACU, the British group, the French group, the ICI, the ICCS. But the majority of them are focused on spina bifida, but are not specially defined for spina bifida. And this is the first concern. The second concern for these guidelines that in no one, we have involvement of patient association that it will be very important for the motivation of patients. Other point is that the European Union presents different scenarios. In Italy, too, we have different scenarios between the north and the south of Italy. Other concern is the lacking point on the transition between pediatric and adult age and pediatric and adult guidelines. Adult guidelines for neurogenic blood that are mainly focused on spinal cord injury. And another point is how to improve knowledge. And this is a paper very interesting of the Dugan presenting how these guidelines, European guidelines are used. How to recognize our neurogenic blood and bowel? Of course, we have to take a history of the patient. We have to evaluate the patient general and neurological status. The bladder diary, bowel diary, Bristol scale could be very useful. To know the medication, the clean intermediate catheterization if performed, the instrumental evaluation. This is the last one because in many patients, a suspicion of neurogenic bladder and bowel can be done without examination. And we need tests only to confirm and to define the lesion. Time requiring. And during the clinical evaluation, we have to evaluate all the patients, not only the genital urinary tract. And we have to check, of course, the lumbar sacral area to observe micturition working or not working, the anus rest tone, the perineal sensitivity, the reflex, the fluid deformity, the hand function. Laboratory analysis, ultrasound, other exams are useful, but are useful to define and to understand which kind of patient we have to treat. But in majority of cases, we can be able to define a neurogenic bladder to have a diagnosis of neurogenic bladder on bowel with its history and clinical evaluation. Urodynamic study, of course, is a, a mainstay for this patient. It's important to maintain the ICCS standard. We have to prepare the patient to perform a correct exam. Is uh, I signed the, the, the uh, or uh, observe the detrusor pressure, real detrusor pressure with a, a rectal probe in order to perform a correct exam. And to, we have to repeat the exam with two filling cycles, a correct filling rate, and a peaceful environment in order to have a, a participation, a conference by the patients. In some cases, we can use uh, electromyography to phase of needle electromyography for a diagnosis of this synergy that is very easy to do with a correct electromyography. But another uh, 
point to discuss for this patient uh, how to perform the urodynamic using sovracumbic or transurethral catheter. Of course, transurethral is a challenging for patients with a sense of urethra, but we avoid sedation, we avoid anesthesia and recovery, but we avoid also the opportunity to do a cystoscopy. That could be very useful in some cases. Video urodynamics is the gold standard for this patient and is very useful in order to understand what's happened to in, into the blood because we can observe if there is a, a reflux, a low pressure or high pressure, and we can see the bladder neck and activity. These are the guidelines of the European Association specific when to perform the different exam at the different age. Of course, if we have performed the fetal surgery in a myelomeningose, and we can perform a first urodynamic before discharge. But we have operated the patient after the birth. We have to wait some months. And then it's better to repeat in the first five years every year, and then every two years, if there are no change of upper urinary tract worsening or no sign of still blood. But what about the outer cause and the, the same indication frequency? Not exactly, because for the spinal cord injury, we have to consider the recommendation for adult patients. For the rectal malformation, there is a a common point of view to perform urodynamic testing only when there are clinical signs of a lower urinary tract dysfunction, starting with a no invasive exam, and to perform uh, invasive urodynamic when we have some clinical situation at the risk, with, as for the fistula or for cloaca, or when there is a positive MRI. The management of this patient is uh, devoted to the quality of life that is uh, mainly related to continence, that means independence, bowel function, that means uh, sexuality and fertility, and uh, for the upper urinary tract preservation, and then means avoid urinary tract infection, avoid vestibular reflux, maintain a balanced blood function. This paper is interesting because of are the effects of fetal surgery. In some promising report, but we have to consider that we have a risk for mother complication and the risk of neurogenic blood after the birth persists. So a long-term follow-up is required and we have to be clear with our patient in order to the possible results. This paper of the group of Utrecht is a mainstay for me for the treatment of a neurogenic blood. The advantage of an early start of clean intermittent catheterization. Clean intermittent catheterization started early at the birth is able to preserve kidney function and blood function. Furthermore, to start a clean intermediate catheterization later in adolescence is very, very difficult and it's better to start when we have the idea that we have to perform clean intermediate catheterization to start as early as possible. About the clean intermediate catheterization, the advantage of sterile clean technique, coated or uncoated catheter, single catheter, multiple use, self-administered, administered by caregiver. We have a lot of, of literature, but uh, the, there is a lack of evidence regarding the major incidence of UTI with different techniques. Some points are very clear, never use latex catheter, and some points are very clear that uh, some, in some cases, it's very difficult to perform clean intermediate catheterization. But why? Because there are economical reasons, difficulty of obtaining catheter, 
a need of education, a lack of specialized nerve for training. Other point of leaf clean intermediate catheterization to remember is the risk of a low adherence, especially in adolescents. This paper of the group of Gothenburg is very interesting because they define exactly when there is an eye of the risk. Drugs, pharmacotherapy, anticholinergic, we know that we have to use, we know because we have to use this drugs, and we know that we have side effects because we have not exactly selected a specific drugs for the blood only. And first of all, we have used uh, and we use oxybutynin, and we use uh, oxybutynin for all administration, intravestical and transdermal. And we know the side effect, we know the the positive effect of, of the oxybutynin, and we know that in some cases we can use other drugs as tolterodine, fesotidine, solifenacine, propiverine, trospium, but that oxybutynin is the only one approved for pediatric use. Now we have also the miraveglon, the, the BT3 and the blocker, and the uh, but the results in children are very small, is very reduced to recommend. Different air treatment and the reasons for switching, in some cases, and the lack of benefits, but it's very common. The main problem, again, is the low adherence during time, especially in adolescents and young adults. Other drugs that we can use as in order to treat the dysfunction, the emptying, and uh, is the use of the group of the alpha blocker, and uh, there are some different results. This uh, is uh, the study and uh, phase three trial with uh, no enthusiastic results, but other study report a very effective result. Every one of us that uses these drugs in a neurogenic patient know that it's common to observe a positive effect in some patients, but it's difficult to define in which patient. One botulin toxin A we can include in the drugs and is effective when the effect of anticholinergic is not reported or there is some severe side effects, and that there is a high nice success rate for continence, for the treasure pressure, for continence, for compliance. There is an action on acetically release, and is most effective in neurogenic detusal activity, less in the low compliant blood. And there are some points to discuss about the dosage, and before we have used for many years at the same dosage of adults, 300, now with the approval for adults on 200 maximum, of course we have to use in children 202. The effectiveness is reported in the, from different situations, but it's common to observe about eight months. And we know that we can repeat. In my personal experience, I have patients that are used in bottling toxin by 20 years. There are some data about the effectiveness of bottling toxin, and this is our study on the safety of to repeat one bottling toxin, and there is no risk of fibrosis on the blood. And one bottling toxin could be used in the sphincter too, and it could be useful in some cases where we can we are not able to start a regular program of clean intermittent catheterization. UTI. UTI is a common to observe in neurogenic blood patient, in patient performing CIC, but is disgusting. The discussion is what is a real UTI, and we have a, a less virulent copy of Escherichia coli, and the uh, different point is colonization, bacteria, by 
from infection and there is no difference between prophylaxis or not and uh, there is uh, no consensus of how to treat this paper of Ziegler about the European study is very very interesting about that for this reason have we suggested other treatment no specific antibiotics prophylaxis as cranberry or dimanosio neurodomodulation neurodomodulation of course is the dream the bladder will start to work again we have no effective result result to for a strong recommendation and so neuromodulation is still investigational because intravesica is not effective the sacral implant is effective in some patients but not in other in our study we have seen that there is no answer no positive answer in malomeningosil patients and we have a good response with acquired spinal cord injury no complete injury and with myelitis and the trans the tense and the percutanus the, the sounds are not effective in this population secondly vesicular reflux is very common to observe in a neurogenic detrusive sphincter dysfunction some treatment have been recommended and no invasive as a clean intermittent anticholinergic botulin toxin the injection of subbulking agents but present a high failure rate and high risk of iatrogenic risk and for a large amount of bulk injectant and the, the urethral replantation blunt the implantation vesicostomy and so on of course we have to manage the blood and uh, this paper gives the group of Marseille is very very interesting because not only for the recommendation of a mean invasive treatment between bulking for injection of the subutral in order to avoid the flux and bottling toxin but because in order to use to come to, to understand the action inside the blood and this is our proposal for the treatment of neurogenic blood secondary reflux using the deflux and the bottling toxin. Vesicostomy is very effective. This paper of these Iranian colleagues showed very well the reduced frequency of surgery after vesicostomy but more effective in our opinion is button cystostomy this is an alternative mean invasive effective with acceptable complication rate neurogenic bowel dysfunction is a missed problem in many patients for many years we haven't considered in the correct way the how was important to treat neurogenic bowel dysfunction important because if you would like to remove PET, I have to treat the blood and bowel dysfunction. The risk of social isolation, the quality of life, the constipation and relation with UTI, and improve independence. This is a, a, our paper, a recent paper of this year, and there is a resume, a review of all the treatment, but also about all the causes of neurogenic bowel. It's very important to stress the role of physical activity in wheelchair too, normally healthy diet, accord fluid intake, probiotics, accord pharmacological treatment, and then, as the second choice, transanal irrigation that is a mainstay of the treatment of neurogenic bowel in the majority of patients where Malone surgery today is a secondary choice but Malone is effective and we have to remember this because when we have, don't have a result with a transanal division we have to be ready to consider Malone of course if we use transanal irrigation we don't have a problem for choosing the appendix for Malone or Mitrofano if we need a derivation and again, 
we know that if we perform malone, we have to then to treat the stomach complication. Sexuality is another missed problem in this patient, and we have a precocious poverty. We know that the level of lesion is strictly related to sex activity, as showed by our Italian colleagues, but also as showed by uh, these Netherlands colleagues that the difference is evident between patients with no hydrocephalus and with hydrocephalus. We know that pregnancy is possible, is a common reserve in our patient, in our adult patient. And one point to consider is the fertile preservation in these people, especially in men performing clean termite catheterization. But the main problem is the lack of information for our patients. Now the, uh, the chapter is for the surgical treatment. Surgery is common in a neurological patient, not only for neurological situation as a, the treatment of continence, preservation of urinary tract and stones, but also for orthopedic scoliosis, neurosurgical, gastrostomy and tracostomy, emergency and the invasive procedure, plastic surgery. And we know that we have an increase in physiology risk for different situations, but every one of them is a situation that we have to consider before to propose a surgical procedure. As we have to consider the different age of our patient, different etiology of the different neurological situation, the prognosis, the motivation, the disability, considering unfunction too, the social and economical situation, the previous surgery, the comorbidities. And this is the reason why, maybe, it's very difficult to have evidence-based medicine data. In a paper of Braski, an Argentinian colleague, there is observation that the rate is very, very low. So the surgery. Surgery could be for improved bladder storage or facilitate emptying, augmentation, when, when other therapies fail, when the renal function is worsened or severe overactivity, high pressure, when the child is ready for it, when the parents are ready, and for improvement of quality of life. So with the augmentation, we have to offer something more respect to the previous treatment. Augmentation with the helium, colon, gastric, ureter, auto-augmentation. Augmentation alone or in combination with blood and neoplasty, the sphincter, the sling, the surgery, reimplantation or channel. But we have always to remember that if we operate and especially if we change the outlet, we have we change the blood and we can serve uh, secondary vesicle retinal flux, and we can observe a detrimental of the blood. So before to consider if the, with the augmentation is required or not, we have to think about the next step after the operation. The advantage of ileum or colon are the same, in many cases, the choice is related to the preference of the surgeon, and there are some risks. And the risks are acceptable, and the risk is major with the stomach that we have used in the past, but now no, because there are high risk of the hematuria and for malignancy. Augmentation is effective. We have complication, we have early complication, we have a risk of a UTI, we have a risk of stones, metabolic, a risk of malignancy, but in is a, a effective surgery, and when we arrive later, and this is very common to serve for patients that we receive as a, a first center as a referral in not at the, at the birth but in adolescent age, that is the only choice. And one point to debate uh, how 
to evaluate the risk of malignancy, endoscopic valuation every year, from which age. In some cases, we can use other segments as a ureter, or we can perform as called auto-augmentation, that is a detrosorectomy. That is effective in some cases, has been used for many, for a long time, 20, 30 years ago, then with the botulinum toxin loose popularity, now is again popular with the robotic and the laparoscopic procedure. Bladder altered procedure, we have to consider a different option. The, but first of all, we have to consider when, because we know, and this paper for me is very interesting, the group of Montreal, that we have a majoration of continents after the puberty. And we have to consider this either in males, either in females. Barking is effective in the short term, as in other experience, is not effective in the long term, as in the observation of the group of French group of relotment. But uh, not worth other procedure. Fascia bleeding is very effective, is easy to perform, and uh, we can use or enforce with an injection of bulking agents in the urethra. CIC is not easy, and for this reason, it's often associated to a channel. In the males, we can use artificial bleeding. In female, TOT transurtulatory presents a high complication rate. Blood outlet procedure, the most effective is the artificial urinary sphincter. And someone advocated as a, a first line treatment, but we know from follow up that there is an high erosion rate, that there is an high revision rate and it's better to use artificial sphincter in post-pubertal patients with a male with volitional void. As a last step, last procedure, we have to consider the bladder closure and when, when all the other options fail, and of course with a stoma, there is a risk of complication, there is a risk of upper unit tract deterioration, but anyway, there is a, is a very effective and in some selected patients changed completely the quality of life. The reconstruction, where our, we have less favorable results respect to blood exophy. The CIC after reconstruction of the blood neck could be not easy. Of course, in, some, in many cases, it's better to create a stoma, and uh, we have to consider the more neurotra is longer and narrower and uh, more easy to observe catheterization, difficulty to, for catheterization. It's very important to evaluate well the bladder before bladder neck reconstruction because there is a high risk to perform augmentation later in a second surgical procedure, and to observe an upper urinary tract damage. The channel and the stoma, when the indication, when the urethra is not available, when we perform a blood and neck surgery, when there is, if we made the transfer for CAC in wheelchair, for the privacy, for the independence. And the the technique of Mitrofanov is very easy to perform. We can perform also by laparoscopy or robotic. And we have to consider some points, short, straight, fixed. But it's very important to consider that it's a part of the neurogenic blood management. That is important motivation, because if we create a stoma, a channel, and then we don't use it's a, a, a surgical procedure, ineffective, and uh, we have to choose where 
to create the soma and the umbilicus or on the lower abdominal wall on the correct side according to patient request. And we have to consider motivation. And we have to consider that during the time we will observe complications that are common to serve as a maloma. For the conduit, is, a, is a, again a last choice. We have to consider this procedure in where other reconstructive surgery is not indicated. Complication rate is lower with colonic. And another option that in some cases, in very, very rare indication we perform in pediatrics is the blood substitution. And again, we have to consider that the surgical reconstruction is the part, not one part of the treatment, but then we have to maintain a correct treatment of the patient from the metabolic point of view. So in conclusion, and uh, we have to start TIC as soon as possible to maintain a control with the urodynamic of this patient and we have to maintain a control of upper urinary tract, especially in the first year of the life. And this is related, of course, to the spina bifida because the risk of possible tethering there is. And then we have to serve with the ultrasound our kidney. And there is some doubt is our voided cystography or the MSA scan are useful. Then the control could be every year and then after two years. And the DMC scan if there we have observed UTI. For the follow-up of the patient, we have to preserve a bladder function and the upper urinary tract to maintain a social dryness and facilitate autonomy of this patient. It's not easy. And concluding, we have three slides for some take-home message. And the neurogenic bladder and neurogenic bladder can result in different conditions. And of course, in some cases, we observe a vesicular retro reflux and UTI. But on the opposite, we have to consider the presence of neurogenic blood dysfunction when we have a vesicular urethral reflux relapse during time. At the second relapse, at the third relapse, it's impossible to do not to exclude a neurogenic blood. In children, the most common is myelodysplasia, but a lot of other neurological conditions exist. Neurogenic blood dysfunction is poorly correlated with the type of level of lesion in different aspects of the adult, and for this reason, urodynamic is very, very useful. Children of a neurogenic bladder present a neurogenic bladder, and the main goal is to preserve upper urinary tract and it's important and continuous. And it's very important to have a multidisciplinary approach to this patient in order to better evaluate their motivation. It's possible with a psychologist. Clean intermittent catheterization must be started soon. And one risk of the clean intermittent catheterization is the aberrance. In my opinion, to have a team of specialist nurses or urotherapists is mandatory for a correct management of bladder and bowel rehabilitation. And the medication has been started early, and again, pay attention to other ends. In some cases, we shift patients from anticholinergic to antibottling toxin because we have the idea that are more effective but they have to, to assume drugs with a low advent. For the bowel tract treatment today is a step-by-step. -step. Surgery is the last choice. For the urinary tract infection, but the urea is common, but the urinary tract infection, or their infection are common, and we have involved a general practitioner, pediatrician, 
in order to avoid unnecessary antibiotic treatment. And we have to pay attention to the transition process because this process often is in the same time of post-adolescent low adherence and it's easy to miss patients and we results will be to have them at home without care. Sexuality and fertility must be considered for the beginning and for this is useful a multidisciplinary team. Ilian colonic augmentation is useful. Of course, a correct means treatment means a very reduced rate of blood augmentation. In my experience, in 30 years experience in my hospital, we have reduced the rate of this patient. But again, we have to be able to perform this surgery as we have to be able to perform all the other surgery for the outlet and for the derivation. We have always to check the blood. A psychologist could, will be very useful in order to understand the motivation of patients. And we have to consider a tailored treatment, consider autonomy and a mental status in the patient. We have to be, we have to must be able, able to offer all options, but we better if we are able to offer a multidisciplinary team for our patient. Thank you. And uh, uh, Luis, I see that uh, there is uh, uh, one question. Yes, that's correct. And uh, the uh, question is regarding the credit. And uh, in my opinion, is not correct because we, if we don't know the, uh, the, uh, I don't see in the cam, in the camera. If we don't see, we don't know the pressure inside the blood. There is a high risk to increase the blood pressure, the intrusive pressure. And uh, uh, of course, we have to consider the different scenarios but the re recommendation is to avoid this maneuver. We have other questions? If anyone has a question, you can type the question and uh, we will get it and send it to, through to Giovanni. Well, I think that's it. Um, Giovanni, thank you very much for your clear presentation. And um, of course, uh, um, the presentation was recorded and you can uh, find it back on YouTube and on our site. I think there's one other no, question. I think, I think that there is another, another yeah. question. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I will send them to. When you start with all strategy for neurogenic blood, uh, which percentage will deteriorate anyway? This is a very interesting question because, uh, of course, there is a group of, of patients where all the treatments are ineffective. But the, the question, uh, the doubt is if we have really performed all a correct treatment because one thing is to prescribe a treatment and other thing is that the patient will perform this treatment. And uh, I think about the CIC. Uh, uh, we know that we have to start CIC purely and it's easy to recommend, it's easy to convince patients, not easy, but and parents, but 
during time, it's very easy to observe that they stop catheterization because that there is no uh, idea about the, a real idea about the high risk uh, related for the upper urinary tract. And there is a, a question by Metternich. Uh, I would like to ask you to perform after introducing cholinergic in conjoined surgery. Okay. And the uh, the question regarded the regarding the uh, uh, when to evaluate after the treatment. Uh, I try to avoid unnecessary invasive examination. If I have introduced a clean intermediate catheterization, I have introduced anticholinergic, and the idea is that the patients are following indication because they present all with the follow-up, and I will perform at the beginning one invasive urodynamic in order to have a check for the pressure, and then we, we will maintain a control without invasive urodynamics. The same for botulin toxin. I presented patients uh, that uh, I'm treating by 20 years. I, I avoid to repeat every time a urodynamic, because if I see that the clinical effect is the same for the creatinine and the ultrasound, are uh, correct, I, will, I, will, I prescribe directly the repetition of a botulin toxin without uh, to avoid uh, to repeat again urodynamic. Uh, there is a, a question about the congenital core when we indicate surgery. There is a fantastic question for for the uh, indication for tethering. And uh, um, we discussed uh, with a multidisciplinary team, with a neuro radio with neurosurgeon and with a radiologist. And he, I can uh, present our uh, choice and we avoid to treat with the tethering all patients that presented occult spinal dystrophy have presented a lipoma. And we uh, observe and uh, we treat patients when we observe the first the, the, uh, worsening. And uh, uh, of course, if we have uh, the um, MRI lesion that show uh, some, desert, some uh, uh, lipoma or something that we are sure that we have to treat, we schedule the treatment. I go to read the question. Uh, regarding the transplant and the augmentation, and uh, uh, this is a good question too. And uh, it depends, uh, first of all, of course, uh, about the status of the blood uh, before the transplantation. Because uh, we have seen that uh, if we have a good blood, uh, we can avoid to perform transplantation. But in many cases, we, per we perform derivation with a mitrofano in order to uh, permit a, a CIC after Accord CIC after the transplantation. Luz, I don't know if I missed some question because. Uh, yes, we do have two more questions, I think. Um, the first one is how long can we maintain uh, self catheterization uh, if the response is good in hyperactivic bladder in association with? Anticholinergica? For always, for all the life. <laughs> if we start, we maintain the treatment. And the other one, I don't. And the other one, 
Um, could you clarify if you start uh, self-catheterization in all children with MMC just after birth, and then eventually after first UD, you let parents to discontinue this procedure? If in, uh, we try to start uh, clean terminated catheterization from the birth, we start uh, clean terminated catheterization in all patients with myelomeningocele, and in patients with uh, occultus spina bifida, we decide if start clean terminated catheterization uh, at the, the diagnosis in uh, according to the bladder situation and also according to the indication or not indication for the tethering by neurosurgeon. Because if we have a, a bladder pattern that is a, a imbalance, we can avoid to start a clean terminal catheterization before the, uh, uh, the, uh, the tethering. But we advise the patients and relatives about the risk, that there is a high risk of uh, to, to perform clean terminal catheterization after the detethering, especially in the shock phase in the first three months. And in some cases, uh, we, the, anyway, we uh, train the patient for clean terminal catheterization, and uh, we recommend them to maintain a, a memory of catheterization, and we can discontinue. Of course, we are thinking about uh, occult spinal dystrophy if we see that there is a balanced blood. The same for patients with anorectal malformation and spinal dystrophy, but in other condition, when we start a predetermined catheterization, and as for myelomeningocele, we have to maintain for life. Okay, I think we have the two last questions um, because of the time. Uh, first question is after Botol injection, when and how do you re evaluate the bladder? Yes, um, as I told you before, it depends from the, the, the patient because, of course, after the first treatment, I always I would like to check after three months how is the fact of the botulin toxin on the blood, three months, because I could be quite sure to have a, a Botox effectiveness at that time. And when I go to repeat many times, if you, I see that there is the same effectiveness regarding continence, regarding UTI, and regarding the upper urinary tract, I can avoid to repeat urodynamic because I could be quite sure about the response. Of course, I've seen in my experience that in some cases, during time, during years, after five years, ten years, I can lose some effectiveness of the botulinum toxin. And the major effect, uh, reduced effect that is common to observe is for the time, because I see patients that at the first injection, they uh, stay well for 12 months, then they reduce this period to eight months, six months. And in this case, it's important to perform a urodynamics in order to have some uh, uh, numeric point to discuss with patients in order to discuss, for example, if it's better to maintain botulin toxin twice per year, or it's better to change strategy for the management. The last question, I know table. Yes, the last question is about the kind of button you use in the button cystotomy. Uh, which kind of button? Yes, I, I use the Nikkei button, is the same for the uh, gastrostomy. And uh, we have a different measure, and uh, the most common use is uh, the 14 French, and uh, we have a different length, and uh, uh, we measure and uh, the bottom at uh, the when we insert, and, uh, and I defined this uh, personal technique that, in my opinion, is very useful. It is easy 
because it's a combination of percutaneous success and with the cystofix and with a wire and then with the dilatation and under cystoscopic control and the when third direct with the, the cystostomy bottom and while for example in gastrostomy we use another device and then they insert at the bottom. And the first change we will perform normally after two months. And the first change I prefer to perform in sedation in operating room in order to be sure about the length and in order to avoid uh, to push on the patient if uh, uh, there is some stricture. And uh, normally the second change will be performed in outpatient clinic when we train the relatives or the uh, patient and then all the other are performed at home. And uh, uh, in my experience is very, very effective and uh, we uh, effective in very young in a newborn, effective in adolescence. I have some patients that prefer to maintain the bottom and to avoid the mitrofano, and they perform normally a, a, a sport activity at the at agonistic level. And uh, of course, you have to check the bladder, you have to check for UTI, but in some cases, very useful. Again, it's very useful in patients that refuse the CIC and it's useful in order to convince them about the advantage of the CIC and it's useful for patients that are discussing, are thinking about the mitrofano because it's useful for them in order to consider the advantage to be dry and also useful for me in order to consider if they are able to manage a mitrofano later. And Again, button cystostomy is very useful in some conditions, as the rabi condition that I presented to you before, as for neurological, neuromuscular disease, where to perform a mitrofanov or to have a sovrapubic catheter uh, could, be, uh, uh, could present some concern. Uh, mitrofanov, because it's unnecessary when I have a reduced consciousness, consciousness of the patient. And for sovrapubic catheter, we have some limitation for rehabilitation and that we don't have with the bottom. And of course, we have a reduced risk, especially in a female for UTI, respect to transurethral catheter. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you, Giovanni, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you to all the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you to the audience for the patience to hear me for one hour. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye.